Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. Nancy, it is a pleasure to have you back on the show, and I'm not going to act like we didn't just talk off air for like 20 minutes. Nancy, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. You had a topic in mind, and when you raised it to me, I was interested because I'd never thought about it before. And would you like to explain this topic to everyone out there? Okay. So many people uh, in JFKA, uh, which is the acronym for uh, Kennedy assassination, uh, in the research, if you say the words, the Minsk photos, they'll know what you're talking about. And what they're talking about is two uh, poses in the central square in Minsk that became the subject of the camera eye of two individuals. And they were shot and they were found later by the CIA and were turned over to the Warren Commission. So you're probably got your mouth open a little bit like that. How would the CIA get pictures from a tourist? Well, we'll walk through that and we'll we'll show you how uh, this, uh, well, I'll show you and Robbie will listen uh, uh, exactly how this happens and what, what part about it's benign and what part about it raises uh, the eyebrows a little bit that you should be concerned and interested about. So the, the official story in the Warren Commission, if you if you open up around page 268 in the original Warren Commission report, not the volumes of evidence, but the report itself, you'll find the story about Oswald and Minsk. Now, this was a period of time uh, in which Lee Harvey Oswald had left the United States and defected to the Soviet Union. Uh, he was trying to get citizenship. They weren't giving it to them to him, but he was in Minsk, had been sent there from Moscow, and uh, he had met and married Marina Prusakova, uh, and she was uh, soon to be pregnant. So um, in the summer of 61, these uh, tourists, uh, two American tourists, uh, and this is how they talk it in the report, very benignly, their names aren't super important. Where they're from isn't important. What they do in life, none of that's important. It's just they were in 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 uh, the Soviet Union, you know, as behind the Iron Curtain as you can get in 1961 summer. And they go to Minsk, which is uh, a few hundred miles away from Moscow to the west. And it's in what's the area called Belarus, which is now we know so well because of Ukraine and what's happening there. But it was actually one of Belarus was one of the Soviet satellite countries at that time of the USSR in the old days where they had 15 republics outside of Russia. And that was what they called the Union of the Soviet Socialist Republic. So the Beatles song back in the USSR is all about connecting with that scenario again. So these two tourists are being taken around the city by an in-tourist guide. Uh, an in-tourist in Russia is you can't walk down the street without approval of the in-tourist telling you that that's okay to do back at that time during the Cold War. So they had an in-tourist guide with them. They were in Rita's car and they were driving to the Mint Square. They get out of the car. Every time they stopped on their summer trip with this car, two women traveling alone, in this case, three women traveling alone with the guide, people would gather around the car and they would want to know, oh my gosh, you know, it's a brand new car. Where'd you get it? How much did it cost? What's the mileage? You know, well, how did you get it here? Yeah, all of that, all of that information. So they we were very accustomed to people coming up to the car and striking up a conversation to that kind of extent. So uh, uh, Monica uh, had a camera and Marie had a camera and Rita was the third woman. And so uh, Rita takes the camera of Monica and snaps a photo. And in uh, you can see the two, the in-tourist guide and uh, Marie talking to each other, Monica talking to each other. And uh, but Marie Hyde, the third person, is not in the in the photo. Over to the right of the photo, um, I was going to show you a photo right now. And Robbie, you can tell me if that looks like that's good. Oswald's all the way. Yep. Yep. And so there he is, way over there. And you see that in the in the bright sweater, uh, sleeve short sleeve sweater, 
there, that's the end tourist guide. That's Monica Kramer. That's the new Singer automobile. And then you see Lee Harvey Oswald over here, three men standing there. And if I get, I may not, there's the little boy in the front. Okay. Okay. And so you can recognize the car because it's got the license plate there and everything. So um, they snap this photo and they go on to take a dozen or so other photos in the city as they're, as they're going through it. So um, after they uh, come back, uh, the we'll go into how they were debriefed by the CIA. But the Warren Commission doesn't talk about that. They just talk about the fact that, oh, we have these photos that, that they turned over and uh, that, that's kind of the end of it. And we and the way we uh, um, determined that this was all Oswald was by the way he stood up up higher up higher. Okay, the way he stood with his hands in his pockets, the shirt actually matches two photographs that were taken of Oswald in 1962 in his apartment in Minsk. He's holding his little baby June uh, in the apartment. So we know that um, that is the same photo, short sleeve, et cetera, same pattern exactly. And so they have pretty much determined this definitely is Lee Harvey Oswald. Well, yeah, he matches those older photographs where it's a younger version of Marina and him. Right. And so uh, in the Warren Commission report, it's all happenstance. Um the ladies didn't know who this was, didn't know who anyone was in the picture. And uh, and that that's the end of it. But to them, it, it helped to prove that Oswald was, in fact, in Minsk. OK, now, Oswald kept what he called his historic diary, which was a handwritten account of his time in the Soviet Union. So he talks about his suicide attempt, trying to get um, citizenship in Russia and they aren't giving it to him. Uh, various things, and then going to Minsk and working in the factory. And uh, it's um, by about the time of um, early 1961, Oswald has been there for over a year now. He defected in October of 1959. They sent him to Minsk, Minsk within three months. He exp He was supposed to, in his mind, be a big deal in Moscow because he had radar U-2 information from his time in the Marines and his time at Atsugi, Japan. And so he thought he would be a blessing in disguise. Well, we know now that Oswald was undercover at the time. He was promoting himself as a true communist believer and a, and a genuine defector. But we understand now that he was in fact an operative of the intelligence service uh, to infiltrate behind the Iron Curtain and get information. So him going to Minsk in this factory kind of waylaid a little bit of those plans, but they made the best of it by having him write up a whole little story about how the factory ran and what they were making. It was a radio factory, what they were making, how they made it, how the people were treated, uh, et cetera, and that. So it was done in the guise of human interest story on life behind the Iron Curtain, uh, but it was really providing a lot of information. Now, he was dyslexic, and so it's surprising. There's a lot of misspellings in his handwritings. But by the same token, he was very good at um, cryptography. So he knew how to right between the lines, so to speak. You know, later on when he was back in the United States and he and he was telling Michael Payne about, oh, I get my instructions on what to do. Um, and Michael Payne's one, and how does that happen? He said, well, I get the communist newspapers and the magazines, and then they're, they're telling me what to do. He's like, uh, you know, wouldn't everyone else know to, oh no, because I can read between the lines. So he is implying that he knows how to read communist information and periodicals and newspapers and understand what they want him to do based on how he interprets it. Later on, when he decides he is going to come back to the United States 
he starts to write again to his mother and his brother, Robert. <clears throat> and during that process, he's writing really inane things uh, in the letter. One researcher, David Lifton, took all of those letters, cut them apart, put did whole huge analysis on it to determine what he was really trying to figure out, which was, I'm through with my assignment here now, and I may not have done everything the right way, and we fooled the army, the Navy so well that they discharged me dishonorably. So they took his normal discharge out of the Marines that he got in 59 and actually changed it to dishonorable. So he's having a fit over that because like, hey, I'm supposed to be protected when I'm here undercover. So he's writing in these letters to Robert. Robert, what have you found out about my discharge? Robert, do you think that they will, will file suit against me when I come back to the United States? He's asking Robert all these things and Robert's got nothing to do with it. So he's he knows that his mail is being read. And we know that now because of Reuben Efren, who we finally found out just within the last couple of years that yes, in fact, he was the person that was reading the mail and reading Marina's mail. And so, you know, he died 30 years ago and it took that long for us to get the information out of the CIA. So um, Oswald was trying to get himself ingratiated back and be assured that one, he'd get his passport back and two, he wouldn't be prosecuted when he came back to the United States. So he starts this process to build a paper trail to come home in early 1961 by writing about it in his diary, I'm disenchant in, you know, disenchanted with the Soviet Union. It's not what I thought it was going to be. This factory is very mundane, things like that. He's he's talking about on and on. And then these letters to and from Robert. Now, Robert, I think, is clueless. Okay. Robert is just answering his questions based on what he's just written on the paper. And not thinking about what does he really mean, what does he really want to know. But the peop but Robert isn't the audience for these letters. The intelligence operations are the audience so that they'll understand what he's thinking and what he wants to make sure that, hey, I could blow the beans here on everything uh, if I wanted to. So I need to make sure that I'm safe and I can come back. That's why when he does get approval to come back, he's like, you guys pay for me to come <laughs> because I, I, I came I came because of you type of thing. So. When you put all of that happening around these three ladies in Minsk and just happening to find Oswald, right? You, 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 it raises a bunch of questions, okay? Supposedly, the two ladies, Rita and Monica, met Marie in Moscow at dinner at their hotel, and she had been separated from her tour group, okay? And so she was trying to figure out what she was going to do. So, number one, how does someone get separated from their tour group in a heavily monitored country like Russia at that time, okay, where in tourists is on top of everything? You can't even stay at a hotel unless in tourists has approved it, pre-approved it. You can't just show up and land in Moscow and say, gee, I think I'd like to visit for a week, and they're going to take care of you. All of it had to be pre-arranged, pre-paid, and then you would be allowed to come in. So, so let's wind back and talk about these three ladies and their backgrounds and figure out what that might tell us about them. <clears throat> so Marie Hyde is about 61 years old at this time. Uh, she, she was uh, born right at that old turn of the century. And she was married to a man who, um, his name is Loring, L-O-R-I-N-G Hyde, uh, who was a merchant Marine. So he had already done a lot of traveling on ships, salvage ships around around uh, different places in the world. They lived up in uh, Washington uh, State, uh, Port Angeles. And uh, it's interesting because Port Angeles, within a couple years of this incident, becomes a very hotbed of political intrigue. You've got several Minutemen that are based there. Uh, you've got these women that I have found more of that travel the globe, they're teachers, okay? And then they get leave of absences and then they travel all over the world, okay? Now, when you think about it, what better cover than a single woman going out 
um, and provide, you know, pro coming home and providing intelligence on what she has seen and, you know, very, um, very much infiltrated in the areas of the world. So you have Marie Hyde in Port Angeles. Her, her, her son is grown. She has grandchildren and she's a world traveler. She's been to Europe, uh, uh, Singapore, I mean, all over the place. So she decides uh, there's another person named Muriel Glasson, who's just about the same age, who lives in Port Angeles, and she's a home economics teacher, and she's world famous. She goes to different countries uh, with Ford Foundation grants uh, and uh, Rhodes uh, scholarships, and she helps countries set up kitchens in different cities so that it teaches people about nutrition and food intake of local cultures, et cetera. So she is um, a world traveler also, just like Marie is. Now, I think they may have traveled together to Greece in 1957, but I don't have absolute proof of that, but I'm still working on that part. In any event, they decide to get together because Port Angeles is only about 5,000 people. OK, so if there's two world travelers there in the town, you bet they're going to know about it because this, this little local newspaper writes about if someone buys a new dress. OK, so they are always writing these little story, human interest stories about oh, Marie Hyde is off on another cruise or or that type of thing. I, I went up there in the 80s and went through their archives. It was like, my gosh, this story writes itself in terms of her background. I've got all this biographical information on her. And so um, that's how she decides that she's going to take this trip, supposedly. And her trip is much more extensive. Uh, she leaves <clears throat> a little bit later than Monica and Rita do. They don't know each other ahead of time. I can find no connection that they know each other ahead of time. Uh, and so Muriel and Marie are going to go through the Holy Land. They end up spending a day at the Eichmann trial. OK, in, in Israel, they uh, they can get in everywhere. OK, they uh, go through Spain and uh, Portugal and Italy and Athens, Greece and Turkey. And then they end up coming back up to Poland where they separate. And Muriel goes up to the Netherlands where she has a week long uh, stint to do some uh, home economics. Uh, work up there and at The Hague. So she has contacts there and she's going to do that. So she's out of the picture then. And that's where Marie is now has bought a prepaid portion of her tail end of the trip. And that tail end is I'm going to I have to pick up my car in Paris that I'm purchasing. And so before I do that, I want to go and see the Soviet Union since I'm so close. So she buys uh, a prepaid trip, and she will hook on to a tour from London that's coming through Warsaw to come into the um, Soviet Union at Brest, which is the western side of the Soviet Union. <clears throat> so she is ready to embark on that because Muriel has left. And uh, they tell her, uh-oh, we've got trouble here. The uh, Orbis is the name of the um, agency that's like the in-tourist in Russia. So it's Orbis in Poland. And there you do everything that they tell you to uh, because, of course, they are under Soviet influence. And so they tell her, uh-oh, your, your tour is late. They are not going to be here for, uh, they're not even leaving for two more days. And so it's going to be at least three or four days that you're going to get whacked off of your Russia trip. But we will let you, uh, and we have gotten approval from the Soviets to let you come in by plane today or tomorrow. And so turns out when she gets to the place for the plane, they don't have a seat, so she has to take a train. So she comes in through the Western side, goes through Minsk. Minsk is a big customs area for Western entry into the United States, into the Russia. And so she has to spend three hours there going through customs and, and and all of that. And they always, you know, when you come into one of these places, they take you to lunch or on a tour. And that's really code for, now we're going to go through all your luggage, okay? And so um, 
they're, you know, she's finally on to this, that this is what happens. And so she tries to carry really personal stuff on her person with in her in her purse or her satchel. And so um, she gets through that. She goes to Moscow, checks into the National Hotel. And so she's trying to figure out what she's going to do now over, because her tour won't get here for three or four more days. So um, we'll leave Marie there because she's just about ready to meet Rita and Monica. OK, so let's go back to Rita and Monica now and figure out they're from Solvang, California, which is outside of Santa Barbara. Picturesque little place. I mean, they have areas that are called Sunny Acres, Happy Farm, Happy Acres. OK, so it's a kind of an idyllic little community, Danish community that has built up. Uh, Monica has roots back to the original Danish people that helped to found the town. Uh, Rita was born in England, uh, had, uh, was a teen, young teen in the war uh, uh, in London. So she went through the Blitzkrieg and all of that. She, at 18, she decides to come to the United States because she has an aunt that lives in Iowa in the Midwest of the United States. And so she stays there for a very short period of time, ends up heading over to the West Coast, does a series of jobs trying to find herself and what she wants. Now, she's kind of a free soul. She's um, she she likes to talk. She um, has an opinion and she doesn't have the best manners in the world. And so she steps on a lot of toes lots of times. And so this is um, very different to Monica. But when she ends up going up to Solvang, they really hit it off together because they both have a love of horses. And Monica has a horse ranch. Monica has money. Uh, she had an egg farm that went viral up in the area, organic eggs and all of that. And then she switched over to horses. So Rita loves to ride every day. And so she's found this fellow, you know, horsewoman that she uh, can really bond with. So um, she, they meet up there. Monica had been born in Southern California, went to USC. She majored in um, social, social sciences, social work. She worked in Santa Barbara at the, what we would call the welfare center. And she really had this feeling to want to help the average person. And she met her husband, they got married um, and they, uh, um, moved to Solvang then. And so she quit that job and, and they started all these other other uh, endeavors. So they divorced not too long. They weren't married too long. And so uh, she had this ranch uh, with another uh, lady friend that um, also was divorced. And they both loved outdoor sports and the horses and, and that type of thing. So um, that's that's the scenario for those two. They had taken a cup. Monica and Rita had taken a couple of little trips. Monica was, um, let's see, was about 29 at the time of this trip. Uh, no, I'm sorry, 32. Um, Monica was 49. And so then Marie is six, 61. So beep, beep, beep. You've got quite a, you've got 30 years age difference between Rita and Marie, right? And they really didn't care for each other on this trip. Uh, even though they were only together about eight or nine days, they they really, uh, you can tell in the interviews and the way they talk. And when I interviewed Marie and Rita separately, uh, I definitely got a, a dose of how much they disliked each other on this trip. And Monica was kind of the, the matchmaker, uh, the not matchmaker, but um, smooth things over uh, on the trip. Peacemaker is what I meant to say. So um, the two ladies, they decide they're going to fly to England or sail to England, and they will up by Liverpool, which is where Rita's family is from. And they spend three weeks up there, and they go around way. They go down to London and buy this car, which is their plan. They want to drive through because they don't want to be whizzing by on a train and not not really see the country that they came to see. Uh, now Monica has been a little bit of a traveler, but not that much. She, she's not like Marie, who is just the world traveler all over. So Monica and Rita uh, are spend several weeks with her family and traveling around the UK, 
uh, getting this car, testing it all out. And then they decide now they're heading over to the continent. So they go up through uh, Sweden and Norway and come in through Finland. Now in London, they had bought a prepaid, prearranged tour for the Soviet Union part of their trip. And that was um, supposed to be for about a week in Russia. And uh, they, like I said, they prepaid for everything, which meant they had to be at certain places at certain times. So they couldn't just say, well, gee, we, this is you know serendipity. This is so beautiful. Let's stay here an extra day. Uh-uh, that, that doesn't happen that way. You're supposed to be at this in-tourist hotel on this day, and then 24 hours later, you need to be at this one. And then, then and only then can you go and show up in Moscow. So they were getting you know, very much on track with that. They, uh, they land in Moscow on August 4th. Okay. Now the, um, uh, they're, they're doing well. They check into the national hotel and, uh, they're, you know, amazed. Their hotel is right on red square. Can you imagine you walk out of your hotel and the Kremlin, all the little turrets and everything are all out there in front of you. It's, it's like something, nothing they've ever seen before in their life. The incredibleness of it, the giant statues, the all, all of those things that are there in Red Square. So they're doing a little bit of touristy things. That night after dinner, the first very strange thing happens. They're talking to some people on the street. And to hear those two ladies talk, it's like, it wasn't unusual to hear Americans talking on the street all the time over there. Who, who, who'd have known? that Americans were overrunning Moscow at the time, okay? Because uh, I, I sure didn't realize that, that, the ease of travel to Moscow at the time. But there were some students there and a professor, and they were all talking like that. And this one fella kind of asserted himself into the group, and she called him Peter. No last name, but just Peter. And he seemed to see, speak some English, and he started chatting them up and kind of flirting with Rita. Uh, so he, he was probably in his late 20s or so. And so she um, uh, is talking to him and likes the interest in that. Uh, and they end up talking about that she has a magazine. You know, he's saying, well, I can't get information about the outside world. I sure would love to. So she says, well, come back to the hotel and I'll give you a Time or a Newsweek. I, I say Time or Newsweek because in some interviews it's Time Magazine and some it's Newsweek. But it's the same incident that, that I'm referring to. So he comes back and when she gives it to him in the lobby, he's kind of like tucks it in his jacket and he's like, doesn't want anyone to see it. And she, he points out this man over in the corner who's kind of watching them and it's like, well, that's not unusual. I'm sure every, you know, everybody's being watched here. So he, um, he says, can you take me to the train station? Cause I have to get back to this city that I'm from. I'm, I'm, I'm only here for the day. So they they agree to do that. And we get close to the train station. And he says, oh, don't pull up right in the front. Pull around to the back. And I, I'm thinking, like, oh, what two women would go and go in the dark alley in the back of the train station to see, uh, to, to drop this guy off. But they did. Okay. So incredibly naive or prearranged or, or something, right? And so... Um, he gets out and then they said they never saw anyone leave so fast in their life as he did to get out of the car and get into the train station. So they thought, well, that's the end of it. We'll you know, never see him again. They go back to the hotel. So the next night <clears throat> they're having dinner at the hotel and the head waiter seats them at a table and, and they bring Marie Hyde over who has checked into the hotel that day. And so they see another American, another American, meet, here Here you are. And so they said, well, that wasn't unusual because they often did that in hotels, that if there were American tourists, they would try to group them together so that they could talk the same language. And, and Marie said, I didn't especially like that because I liked meeting new people that were from other cultures and other, even if they're other travelers, uh, uh, <laughs> they're not Russian. Uh, I would get to find out where they were going, what they had seen. And they might tell me about something I didn't know about in the area to go go look at and visit. So she was a little disappointed being stuck at this table with you know English speaking Americans. Uh, but she strikes up this conversation with the two, finds out how they are driving through Russia. And she's pretty excited about this now. Um, 
So she says, you know, I've gotten separated from my tour group. Um, and so uh, I'm kind of on my own here. So the next, you know, the, the, they leave the hotel and they start to go out on the street again. And Rita and Monica see Peter out there on the street, down the street. They're like, what? I thought he was supposed to go to that, back to his town last night on the train. Why Why is he here? Uh, so he sees him. He comes over and, hi, hi, you know, not a, not a word about why he is still there. And he starts, and, and they start to introduce Marie to him. And when they go to say, this is Marie, they she stops him and she gives a fake name. And they can't remember what that fake name was, <clears throat> but they, um, Marie obviously doesn't want to engage with this guy. So when they get back to the hotel, uh, the three ladies, Marie tells him, that guy approached me at the museum today and he tried to exchange uh, U.S. dollars for rubles. So I don't, I don't want anything to do with him because I, I, don't, I don't think he's legitimate. So that kind of answered for them why she gave, she didn't want to get engaged with him in any way. Uh, so then the next day they're doing touristy things together and they decide, uh, Marie comes up with the idea of, gee, it would be really nice to um, see the country more. So she makes a financial arrangement with them to help pay for gas and that, and she would get her own room and that, and then uh, to be able to go along with him. So her tour group was supposed to come to Moscow, see Moscow for a few days, and then start traveling up northwest towards Helsinki, which is the, the customs place to cross at the border is Vyborg, Russia. And so that's that's how you would go out that way. So instead, she's going to go southwest through Smolensk and Minsk on the way to the border with Poland. So a completely different route that she would be taking. You wouldn't go that much to the east because it's the Ural Mountains, it's Siberia, it's all of this. So you either go this way or you go this way. So now she's completely changed her direction. So she goes to Intourist to get her visas and all of that. No problem. She gets her visas, visas in a day to completely change her route and latch on to the hotels that those two ladies have, which was their original exit out of <clears throat> Russia. So because they had come in from the Northwest and we're going to make a, a, let me go closer and it go like this into the country. So um, that is very unusual that you could train, change your travel plans in route like that. So the mystery wasn't about how she got separated from her travel group. That was really legitimate. The odd part about it is that she was able to, once she got into Russia, change her plan so dramatically. Uh, and what was the purpose of that? So they, they, they stay in town long enough to see the big parade that's happening for the uh, cosmonaut Titov, who had gone up in orbit uh, earlier in the week. So they're having a gigantic parade and speeches in Red Square, right outside their window. Now, Marie always makes a point about, I always got the best room wherever I went because I always went first class. So I I had a room right in the front of the hotel with my windows overlooking Red Square. Now, poor Rita and Monica, they had to stay in the back of the hotel. So they had they had other buildings to look at in the back, but it wasn't Red Square. So I invited them to come to my room so that you they could see the parade and see all, all the stuff. So uh, during the course of the parade, Marie ran down and bought two small little um, flags for the two cosmo cosmonauts. And um, she actually showed those to me when I interviewed her uh, <clears throat> in the 80s. And uh, she was very proud of still having them uh, as a memento of the time. So they watched that. They had packed the car up early in the morning and parked it on a side street so they would be out of the way of the crowds. And so then they get in the car about four o'clock and take off for uh, Smolensk on the way to Minsk. So they go there. They spend the night. Nobody talks about anything important happening there other than that they spent the night. Next morning they get up. And now this is the, the fateful day that we've all been waiting to hear about. 
And this is when um, they get there then. And these are huge driving distances, like, you know, 250, 300 miles. And you can only go like 45 miles an hour. So these are five, six hour long drives to get between these cities because it's just so vast. So they, um, uh, they're really tired when they get there, but they check in, <clears throat> go upstairs and Rita gets a call to come back downstairs. The manager wants to talk to her. So he brings her in, has the in tourist guide. Her name is Svetlana come in because she can speak English and Russian and she translates for him. And he tells her, you know, what the hell are you doing here? Why are you here? Why are you giving propaganda to Russian citizens? So that was all about that magazine that she had given in Moscow. So she had been observed doing that. They were following her because of that. They were checking on her because of that incident. So she she is at the same time scared and very upset, upset that this man is talking to her that way. Uh, and scared that I'm in this foreign country and I could go in the gulag and people would never hear from me again. So she is, um, she listens to this. And then finally he says, you know, watch your place, know where you are, et cetera. Now you need to go with this in tourist guide and take a tour of the city. <laughs> That's exactly what I want to do after getting creamed by the hotel manager. So they go and they get in the car and now there's four ladies in the car driving around. And uh, both Rita and Monica say they stopped at Red S at Central Square in Mintz because Marie Hyde wanted to take a picture of it. Now, when Marie was coming by train into Moscow, she went through Minsk, and she had to stay there three hours to go through customs. I don't think that's enough time for her to have gotten from the train station to Central Square and back again and also have lunch, which was also on the agenda for her to do. Uh, and so I don't think she had actually been, because my question was, oh, if she'd gone through Minsk, hadn't she already seen it? And hadn't she gotten any photos of what she wanted with that? So they said, um, so I, I, I can't prove that she had been to that square before or anything. So um, they get out of the car, the people are gathering and all of that. So Rita takes this first photo, uh, but before she takes the photo, she goes, she's still very upset about this um, incident at the hotel. And she's not that interested in seeing the the Palace of Culture and, and the 33 foot tall statue of Stalin. She doesn't care about that. So she goes across the yard into a little, some little shops and there's a record store there. And so when she comes out of there, she runs into uh this American guy who later turns out to be Oswald. And he's asking her about the car and the records and all that. They walk up together to the car. Okay. So they, she takes her picture and she captures the, 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 the three men and the boy and the two ladies. And then Marie says, here, take my camera and I want to get in the picture. So then we have, the second photo, which is this one. Now here... Oswald's kind of cut off in that one. Yeah, he's kind of cut off a little bit. But he's looking face forward. In the, in the picture that's actually the exhibit, he's full in it. This is just my cropping, bad cropping job. So, but they're all pretty much in the same positions. You know, their feet haven't moved on the geography of which they were standing, right? And so they had to have been taken really close together because the little boy is almost in the exact same position. Yeah. You put them side by side. But now you see on the, on that far side, that's Marie Hyde. In the middle is the interest guide. And Wait, then can, that- Can you show the other photo? So she managed to get all the way in that photo shot and them still be standing in almost the exact same way. Right, right. Oswald has turned face forward. That's how fast the two pictures were taken, okay? Was she all the way off to the side, or was she the one taking that photo, and then she got out of the photo to get into that? Because that she, doesn't no, no, make no. sense. Rita is not in either photo. So the lady that's on added on the second photo that you're showing, the one that's in your... 
the in your left hand yeah so she must have been standing off to the side the only thing i see is that they might have yeah she must have been standing way off to the left and decided to come in the photo or she was standing in in the back of the car behind the camera yeah but even then how do you stand that close without moving that much even if she was like hold on let me come in for a picture right well see the if you look at monica and svetlana the interest guide they are heavily uh, engaged with each other talking okay so they're not really paying attention to marie it doesn't seem anyway but it let's see i can you don't really care about uh stalin over there uh but even when marie comes in it looks like they, the girl in the red on this in the second photo that you're showing um she looks like she doesn't she's standing back a little bit for marie yeah she's standing back and she's looking forward now rather than sideways so in this one both Svetlana, Monica, and all the men are looking sideways. And in this one, now you start to see it's a little a little who's, different, right? First of all, who's the parent of that child to be like, turn around, look at the damn camera? <laughs> it's this guy with the cap is the is the parent of this child. And they are only speaking in Russian, okay? But Oswald is speaking in English. <clears throat> and uh Rita thinks he's speaking very good English. She said at first she wasn't sure he was American if he was speaking such, you know, he was, but he was speaking very good English. So those two pictures get taken. And so they go on their trip, the rest of their trip. They head out to the border. At the border, their car practically gets ripped apart. They even roll it over a pit so someone can go underneath it and check it all out. And they say, we're looking for papers. So they found the registration papers and the um, ownership uh, and the, <clears throat> the contract for buying the car all in the glove compartment because she wanted to have proof that she owned it and that she hadn't stolen the car or anything on this trip. And so they, they got all excited because that was in English because she bought it in London. And so they had to bring someone in to translate the whole thing. And then they, uh oh, you know, and then there was some sweater that had, you know, you have these big giant labels on your sweater for care and all of that. They saw that inside one of her sweaters and they got all excited about that. Well, it turns out to be washing instructions. OK. And it was a sweater she had bought in uh, uh, Sweden, I think. So it was. Um, they were there for several hours and they kept saying, what are you looking for? What are you looking for? We're looking for papers. We're looking for papers. Well, they never supposedly found any papers, but here's the odd thing. Later on, when I tell you about them being interviewed by the FBI, FBI agents are wonderful back in those days about how they record information when they're honest and they record everything. Um, the, the subject, um, uh, scratched his ear a number of times during the interview. Okay. They don't say why. They don't speculate as to why he was scratching his ear, but they do note it because it they were trained to note and record what they saw. So in both of the interviews, they say Monica Kramer referred to her notes extensively during the interview. So she had notes, her trip notes that she had taken during the interview. And Monica and Marie up in Port Angeles, Little Miss Society Lady, uh, where she is filing reports with the newspaper every week on her trip abroad, and they are publishing about it. Oh, she was in Greece today. Oh, she was in Turkey today. Blah, 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 blah. Uh, she is she is also referring to her extensive notes uh, during these interviews. So wouldn't those have those both of those would have been in English? And wouldn't that have been quite a prize for them to have? Because, um, you know, they had been through uh, Hungary and Yugoslavia over in Belgrade. And, and, you know, two days after they left Poland, after they exited, the Berlin Wall went up. <laughs> so they are, they are in a period, a hotbed period of time when Soviet-U.S. relations couldn't be more wound up and 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 ready to spring um and they're just driving around <laughs> nothing to see here just doing this now when they took this picture in the square they say that was just a guy we we had no idea who he was no no clue whatsoever 
uh, we didn't even think about him because people were always stopping and looking at the car. So it was really no big deal. So Rita and Monica separate from Marie in Poland. But before that happens, Marie is called down by the manager. And he tells her, what do you know about these two ladies that you're with? So clearly, the Soviets have sent information on about watch these women. Uh, they, there's there's something going on here or whatever. And, um, you know, keep an eye on them and don't trust them. And da, da, da. So she says, oh, I've known them for just a few days, but they seem perfectly fine to me. And and so, of course, they were treating her with first class effort and rolling the red carpet out and everything. And so she left uh Warsaw and went to Paris, picked up her car and hopped on a, a freighter out of Cherbourg, France, and um, headed over to New York, uh, where she was met by her husband. And then they drove the car back across the country uh, to Washington State. Meanwhile, Rita and Monica continued their trip through all over Europe, Czechoslovakia, Yugoslavia, France, uh, the Pyrenees. Uh, all around Europe before they wound up at Sherbrooke. And then they, um, she brought the car back with her uh, to uh, to New York. And, you know, in, that, in those days, it took about 10 or 12 days to cross uh, the Atlantic uh, for those trips. And so that's the end of the trip. Okay. Any thoughts, any comments, or should I go on? Uh, I'm going to let you go on. I'll ask my questions at the end. Okay, so now we're <coughs> we're in a position where it's September, se September-ish, uh, early October, and they're they're Rita and Monica are in Solvang, Marie's back up in Port Angeles, and they start giving interviews, in in depth interviews to the the local press. The one with Rita and Monica uh, end up uh, hitting to Santa Barbara, which is a bigger bigger area, academia, et cetera. So a lot of opportunity for informants in that area to see that article and bring it to the CIA's attention. So, I mean, the method and operations at the time, and probably still are to a certain extent, was that you had scientists, you wanted scientific information, you wanted academic information, you wanted cultural information, about these other the people in the, the the countries in the Cold War. And so when this pops up in Santa Barbara, that is probably the catalyst that sends uh, Mina Volmany, a CIA contact division person in Los Angeles, California, up to Santa Barbara to interview these ladies and debrief them about their trip. Not unusual at all. George DeMornschild got debriefed all the time when he came back from a trip abroad. So it's, um, it really does, yeah, it's standard. And they generally don't go to you ahead of time and say, uh, see all that you can and then come back and tell us They for the average person. For George, they did tell him that. Go see all you can. And especially we're looking for the scientists you're going to meet because you're going to this institute and everything. But with these two ladies, they they they, they ride horses, okay? They run a grocery store and they ride horses and Rita does real estate. So they um, uh, are, are really not, not people that you would go ahead of time and say, yeah, infiltrate all you can and let us know. So um, she goes up in March of 62. So that's just, you know, six months after their trip. And so they tell her all about the Peter incident, who they thought was just a student or whatever. And that they elaborate a little bit more now and say, oh, and besides all that, the, the, the second night that we met him and stuff, he declared undying love for me. So maybe he was trying to get to marry one of them and be able to get abroad, get out of the USSR. Who knows? But she said we didn't trust him. And that's why that third night we just eluded him because we didn't want to make contact again. We thought we would just get into trouble with him. So she tells them all about this Peter incident and 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 they don't bat an eye. They they don't do any follow up on it. They don't um she doesn't talk about this incident in Minsk in the she talks about the hotel man yelling at her and that they took a tour, but she doesn't talk about taking photos by the car or anything cuz 
she said that the people stopped and talked about the car all the time. And she didn't even remember at that time that she had taken pictures, but they had 160 slides. So they give the whole 160 slides and the eight millimeter film that they had and let Mina take it back. She sends it to HQ and uh, they, they go through it and they say, we found five slides of interest. And one of those slides happened to have the three men in it, right? So this is the, the one that they saw is the one with just two women. This one. Yep. Okay. And so they put it into their CIA graphics division over in the Russian section. And it just gets filed in there. And I think the notation on it is something like in tourist guide, Central Square, Minsk, um, uh, American tourists, something very, very mild and benign uh, on it. So that's kind of the end of it. They talked to her about we had a, a third traveling companion that we met in Moscow uh, and we went all the way to Poland with her and yada, yada. But they don't give her name. And Mina doesn't ask the name, which is kind of strange. So that's the end of it there. Now, fast forward two years. No one has contacted Marie, at least not in the record. I can't find it anywhere. And they're starting to study under the Warren Commission, Oswald's Russian period. So the CIA gets tasked, find out anything in your Minsk piles, because he spent over a year there. He spent about a year and a half there. Uh, and let's find out if we can see what he was up to, what he was doing there, besides what he says himself. Uh, Oswald's historic diary has a very large period of covering a whole month that he says he was in Minsk. And that date that the picture was taken falls within that. So Oswald himself doesn't uh, really prove that he was in Minsk or not that day, okay? But it's a pretty good uh, likeness. And then the shirt is something else, okay? So in in they, they discover this photo in the graphics division and the CIA is like all in arms. My God, we've got a picture of Lee Harvey Oswald and it's in Minsk and it's in the time period when he supposedly was living there. We have to find out more about this. So they sent, they sent, to the FBI, you need to interview your two sources again for this picture and find out everything you can about it and find out about who the third person is that they're talking about, that they traveled with. And then you need to report back and then we'll coordinate a reply that we'll send to the Warren Commission and advise them of these photos. So of course, Hoover being Hoover, Helms is trying to build re be real secret. Hoover decides, well, I'm not going to let the CIA beat me to the punch in telling the Warren Commission because I, I, I am king of the jungle and I, I know all. So he tells Gerald Ford, we have this photo of Oswald and Misk with tourists. And so Ford, being his little lackey on the Warren Commission, goes and tells Earl Warren, we have, they have this photo and they're getting more information on it. So they end up, FBI interviews Marie. Rita and <clears throat> Monica. So now that their FBI agent is pointing out, do you think that man looks like Lee Harvey Oswald? And they go, oh my gosh, it does, it does. Well, I did, we didn't know that at the time. We never knew, heard the name Lee Harvey Oswald until the assassination, we saw the newspapers and we never made any connection with it because we couldn't even remember the photograph. But they have been showing these slides <laughs> Remember, for the first six months after they came back, they were showing these slides. So they had actually looked at that photo many times. So you'd think you'd kind of maybe make a connection. Maybe not. If they start hearing about the assassination and this chief suspect, and they said he was in Russia, and he was there during the summer of 61, that wouldn't ring a bell with you at all to say, let's go look and see what we might find in Minsk. You know, out of 160 slides, there were only about 10 that were Minsk. So it's not even like you got to go look at 160 slides, go look at the 10 or 12 surrounding that, that period of Smolensk and Minsk. Um, 
and uh but no they they're they're playing oh i don't know and then, and now they're trying to distance themselves from <laughs> they can't deny they're in the photograph right except rita can because she's not but marie and monica are saying things like well monica you notice how i kind of have my my back to those men see i'm not really looking at them i'm not even sure i noticed that they were there <laughs> okay so on one hand they're telling us oh my gosh you've got People always came up around the car. And now she's saying to the FBI uh, in 64, I, I'm not even sure I noticed. I know I didn't talk to him uh, or anything. Then you get to Rita and Rita starts babbling on about, oh, yeah, I talked to him about the car and he spoke English and blah, blah, blah. Right. And so I can't imagine that everybody didn't notice that they were talking to us and that. So they're contradicting each other about what they observed and didn't observe but you know it's it's a human nature thing to try to distance yourself and say uh, I, I don't any i don't know anything i don't know anything about it so but they didn't really actively pursue it they had him sign affidavits uh but only uh marie wasn't asked to sign an affidavit uh after the fbi interviewed uh mosk uh one of the staffers from the warren commission uh, called them on the phone, Monica and Rita, and uh, and talked to them. And then he had transcribed an affidavit record of the telephone conversation. And then he sent the U.S. Marshals out to have them sign it with a notary. So they um, that was the end of it for them. So in the Warren Report, they publish this photo as the photo in the Roaring Report. They published both photos in the exhibits, but I think it's interesting that they did this one. Plus they numbered this one D211, which was the second photo, and they numbered this one D209, which was the second photo. So it's, it's, it's kind of strange. They were paying a whole lot of attention to this one because, um, Oswald is looking more towards the front in this one. So uh, that's that was the Warren Commission, and that was all that they had. So it's really quite a ways after the Warren Commission. Um, who, you know, Helms is so pissed at Hoover for jumping the gun and telling the Warren Commission about it. But not to worry, because the Warren Commission lost it over and didn't do any further investigation on their own. They just took what in, what information Hoover gave them. They didn't. They were never told about the CIA debrief in '62 with Monica and Rita. So, yet another thing in CIA files that we have since gotten that shows all that back and forth cat and mousing that the FBI and the CIA were doing together uh, uh, behind the Warren Commission. Okay, so. Nothing really happens after that until 1972, and that's the church committee, and uh, they're looking at some different things. So they go back and ask the CIA, and they just give them the same same story again on it. And then you have the House Select Committee in 78, where they do actually go and interview um, uh, Rita and uh, Monica, but don't really have anything new information out of it. And uh, they can't find Marie because she has left Port Angeles. And she's actually living down in Southern California at that time. And that's how I ended up finding her so that I could interview her a few years later. But um, not, the, the House Select Committee was more interested in whether the existence of those photos proved that the CIA was carrying a duplicate file on Lee Oswald. OK, so they didn't doubt that it was Lee Oswald in the photo. Uh, and just to show you how compliant Marina was with the Warren Commission, when they went to her and said, do you think back in 64 and said, do you, do you think this is Lee? You know, does that look like Lee Oswald? And she said, oh, yes. And that, you know, I don't know. It could be. Yeah, it, it does look a lot like him. But did he ever tell you about classic Marina? Yeah. Yeah. Did he ever tell you about um Meeting tourists or anything like that? Not really. I'm not saying it didn't happen, but I, I I don't remember anything like that. So they go back to her a week later. 
ching, the light bulb had gone on now, okay? So now all of a sudden, oh yes, yes. One day he came home that summer and he said, on his way to the grocery store, that's funny because it was, he's not carrying groceries, okay, in these pictures. Where's the groceries at? Oh, I forgot them. Yeah, Sorry. I, I don't see any groceries. Um, he ran into some American tourists in the square and, and talked to them a little bit. And one of the women even said, oh, you speak such wonderful English. So, <laughs> so that was the story there, which was now more closely matching the story of Rita and Monica. That he spoke good English and he was in he was in the square there talking to them. So yeah, like you said, classic Marina. Uh, and so uh, so I mean, is it any wonder that she hasn't given interviews in how many years, right? Uh, and so um, the 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 select committee deter they determined to their satisfaction that um, the photo was unidentified as Oswald in the graphics division until 1964 when it was just happen chance, happenstance that it, it was located by visual identification of the photo in the file. And, and that was the end of it. I mean, they did a big 20 page report on it that was classified by the CIA and we have it now, but it took that many years for it to become unclassified. And uh, that's good old Betsy Wolf uh, at her best describing everything about it. But she, here's a kicker. They referred to this classified report in the Warren Commission report in the footnote, but they weren't allowed to quote from it and they weren't allowed to put it into the exhibits. Okay. So um, until just a few years ago, we, we did not have this actual report. Uh, so there's, there's that summary. So that was 1978. Okay. And that's, that's really the last time that anything major was happening with the government. What happened a couple, well, 1979, late 79, was Anthony Summers, the author of the original book, Conspiracy. He interviewed Rita uh, in Solving. And there she tells him for the first time ever that she had seen Oswald in Moscow. The interest guide had taken them to the Moscow Film Festival. And when they were coming out, a student approached them and spoke to them in English and uh, talked to them for a few minutes. And then the interest guide got nervous and made them move, made him move on. OK. And so um, when they got to Minsk, she recognized him as that same man. So Anthony Summers didn't say if they had a conversation with each other, Rita and Oswald acknowledging recognition of each other, he doesn't tell us that, but he does describe this incident. So he published in 1980, I, I read that. And so I decided that, um, let's see, I didn't, I didn't get to Rita until the nineties. Uh, but when I interviewed her, I asked her why, why did you tell, you had just been interviewed within the last year and a half by the House Select Committee, and you didn't tell them about that? You didn't think that was important at all? And I said, why didn't you tell them? She says, looks at me and says, they didn't ask me. Just like that. They didn't ask me, which you hear all the time, right? If someone asked me the question, I answered the best I could. But if they didn't ask me, I wasn't going to go there with anything on it. Okay? And so to me, that's classic Rita because she's kind of a smart alecky person uh, from what I met with her. <laughs> and I spoke to her for over two hours. So I, I felt I had a pretty good sense of her because I had written all the, I had read all the reports by that time. Um, so she, she didn't have any remorse at all that she hadn't told anything about it, uh, that she was entitled to her privacy and blah, blah, blah. I mean, I was shocked that she agreed to talk with me. Monica wouldn't talk with me. Um, Rita died just a couple years after that uh, interview, no connection. Uh, and I tried to go after Monica again, and uh, she she wouldn't uh, she wouldn't do it at that time. But but she was quite a bit older then too, so I don't know how fruitful it would have been. So that's kind of um, where we stand with things. I think that's pretty much uh, 
what I've got to say on that. What were your conclusions based on your interviews that you had with them? My, my conclusion is that um, it, I, I really wish that the CIA had gotten out of her that she had seen him in, uh, in Moscow too, because that would have given us an opportunity to go after when he left Minsk and how he had the freedom to move to 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 move around Moscow like that, uh, because he didn't record it in his diary, and uh, Marina never sm- spoke about it, and no one ever went back and asked Marina, uh, did he go to Moscow? Do you remember him ever talking about meeting somebody in Moscow or whatever? He probably met all kinds of people that he never told her about. I don't, I don't, I don't doubt that for a minute, but. Um, she she was in such a position of wanting to say what she thought would please the people or else um, it, I find her two ways. One is she wants to please and the other way she wants to just screw with your mind. OK, so it, it, it's both ways with that. But I think that um, I think that Marie, gosh, she needed so much examination because I'll bet she was debriefed. By CIA people before I can't believe as much travel as she did, that she wouldn't have been debriefed, but we don't have those documents. So, you know, I think they were either destroyed. I think Marie was definitely a person that would be debriefed when she came back and she had loose lips. She would tell you everything that had happened to her. She had opinions about everybody. You know, she thought she was, she was, um, she was very anti-Semitic. You could tell in her uh, reviews about Jordan versus Israel uh, and um, the city split and and all of that. She had definite views on that. Uh, and she, um, I think that she has had more to tell us uh, about her situation uh, and that, and maybe that's all it is, is that she was simply a um, uh, informant of providing information um, after the fact with that. Uh, so I think I think the pictures are legitimate. I think they're real. Um, I, if I'm, I think that Stalin pitch statue came down by the end of the year that they were there and they replaced it with a Lenin statue <laughs> there in, in the central square. So that's why I'm saying they were there in such a volatile time. Their visit required a hundred times more scrutiny than it got. But what I have determined as I've looked through these women is that there's a whole group of these women that are school teachers or other that you would call nondescript jobs. I value teachers, but people would call that that's women's work that's at that time. It's women's work, it's not of consequence, et cetera. Uh, so what that you're shaping the little minds of the yeah. future. Um, but Marilyn Murat is another good example, okay, of someone that if you look back at her records, you know, how many times she got leave of absences from school and teaching so that she could do some traveling. And she would do it in little one and two month stints or she would do it in much longer stints. And her, uh, you know, she was abroad when she found out that um, Lee had defected. So she she had connections. She had lots of things going on. So I thought it was very unusual for women to travel alone without the company of men at that time. And it turns out it's not. It's absolutely not. These women could go in. uh, You know, they use women in a variety of ways. You know, there were the Red Sparrows with the Russians, right, uh, to be the honey traps. And then you could have these women that are single. They don't have to worry about killing the mother of kids or, you know, a wife or anything. It's a single woman. And she can go in and uh, be very nondescript. Uh, in places and pick up all kinds of information. You know, first of all, they can pick up paper propaganda, which is useful to bring back home. Then they can also pick up what they hear and what the culture is showing and that. So that's going to be another aspect of this women's is that it's kind of uncovered this whole little litany of females that were out there doing that. I don't know if there were male teachers doing the same things, but they certainly were using females. Some of the most effective uh, 
soldiers during the Cold War were women. Nobody suspected them of being spies or anything like that. Yeah. Well, there's this new book out on June Cobb or Yeah. With the other. That one, uh, it's 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 a little sad. Uh when you spend that much print uh for those conclusions and that, uh, which I don't think are there. I've read it now finally. I've been offered to talk to that person and then i was like uh, looking at the kind of the ending of the book and i was like nope i'm all right i'm good i don't have time well, for that. but you know if you interview her then you do the counter you do someone to critique it okay and then you, you marry those two things together that'd be true but then there's like there's other work out there too like i mean there's people that try and draw the ufo connection to the jfk stuff and i just i just don't have time right now to try and bog all to that like that leads you to a rabbit hole because there's, there's the guy that thinks that it was a Jewish. Um, yeah, I've had him on. Right. Okay. So um, I'm all about right now. It's not even about like everyone wants to solve it. I'm just trying to figure out historical what is not contested anymore. And I don't think I think there's a lot of things like Gerald Ford moving the back wound up six inches. That's not a conspiracy. That's not contested. That's just factual of what exactly happened. When you look at the things in the assassination that have nothing to do with Oswald, that he would have no power or influence in or no mob figure would have power or influence in. Those are concrete. Where's JFK's brain? Oswald didn't have the ability to come back from the dead and be able to lose his brain. There's just key things that I feel like the audience or any viewer in my interest would be to get the public's interest into this, to highlight some of the works. Now I do like having researchers on like yourself that focus in these specific areas because I can't do that. I'm not a researcher. I'm just someone that's interested. I mean, I, I like touching the term researcher when it just comes to trying to put the historical documents together. Um, but really everything that's like, it's just like, just give me the top five things. Here it is. This is what's crazy about this and how it's a little bit more than a lone assassin. And if you can get the public to listen to you on those, if you can give them that, they give you that five minutes, you'll see them be like, that's weird. Is that real? And I'm like, here's the best part. Pull out your phone and Google it. And then you start, they start Googling and they go, wait, his brain is missing. I'm like, yeah. And then I'm like, wait, Gerald Ford did move the back wound up six inches. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, see, now let me take you the rest of the way. And then you kind of start going with the more concrete stuff. But through all this that you just explained, did you feel like they were holding back any information from you during any of the interviews that you had? Because obviously you couldn't get all the time in with the time that you had. Right. So the holding back side of it to me comes in on Rita and Monica. I separate them from Marie. So on Rita and Monica, it's like, I wish that day had never happened and that this never intruded into my life. So the reticence on their part, okay, uh, I got more of a sense of that, that it was it was benign from that perspective. So I don't see either Rita or Monica in any of the events of their life before or after that would lead me to conclude that... Um, they were surreptitious in doing this, okay? That uh, the last place Rita wanted to be that day after getting chewed out at the hotel was in that square, okay? But she was a young woman, and if a man was gonna pay some attention to her somewhere, she she was okay with that. So if it was Peter in Moscow, um, someone that she called Phil in another interview, uh, which I could never get to the bottom of with her. I think it was a conflated Phil and Peter story. Uh, and or whether it was Lee flirting with her a little bit. Because she was she was very cute. She was kind of a small, slender, pixie-ish. Uh, and that, and she, um, beautiful smile and that. And she would have had the English accent a, a little bit still. And uh, so that was still, uh, that, that, that would have been appealing. I, I would have think uh, so flirting uh, doesn't mean that you're a agent for the government or, or anything. So I can't see Rita and Monica as that Marie. I don't see her as an agent of the government, but I see her as a, a witting participant of providing information. Okay. Not orchestrating actions or anything like that. Uh, and her husband, um, he 
he seems totally in love with the sea, totally in love with anything maritime. And um, he died in 1975. Uh, she died close to 10 years after. They had one son. Um, he's passed on. I interviewed him. So, and I've been in touch with extended relatives of the Hydes. And there's all kinds of rumors and stories within the family about their personal life, which is unimportant to the story. <laughs> in my mind, it would just be ridiculous to print it at this point. But um, they, uh, there, there's one woman that I spoke with uh, that remembered very specifically the FBI agents coming up in 1964 uh, to talk with Marie. And so that was kind of, a, it personalized it uh, in terms of uh, the, the interview there. What about the faults of the Warren Commission into investigating or just questioning more? Or looking it's it's, it's just another example, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, it's another example of uh, leaving Hoover to provide the investigative track and trusting either because they didn't want to take the time, the Warren Commission didn't want to take the time or they didn't have the resources. They didn't have, they didn't really use subpoena power um, at the Warren Commission. You know, the House Select Committee, they made sure that they got heavy duty subpoena power and uh, uh, immunity so that they could draw people in to tell what they knew, okay? okay? So that was one good thing about the HSCA, but the, the concentration of the House Select Committee on the mafia, is, is such a travesty. And even Blakey will say that now. Well, that was their fault for putting Blakey in charge of that. I mean, the guy's organized crime focused and you had him leading the investigation. Of course, all his questioning is going to be focused towards that. Right. But it's, it was it was the, also the government's fault putting Warren, Earl Warren, as the head. Because, you know, LBJ scared the crap out of him about uh, nuclear war. And that would all be at his doorstep. Uh, but he's not that simple minded. So he understood what was at stake uh, politically, besides just the devastation of millions of people uh, through a nuclear uh, attack. So, uh, you know, it's it was a game of chicken at that time, right, with the nuclear war, whether it's the Bay of Pigs or you're looking at today with Ukraine. Uh, Putin's playing a game of chicken again with the nuclear. Maybe I could just put, you know, release a small one, right? It's just just a small one. Yeah, that won't do any damage. Um, <laughs> where can people find your links, Nancy? I appreciate the time uh, you've given me some time on my show to talk about this. I highly recommend the Dealey Plaza UK website. Uh, it has uh, it has a lot of speeches that I've done for them. I did one on Michael Payne last fall at their Canterbury conference. Uh, that I think had some good information on his background, how he thought and how he um, uh, interacted with Oswald and why that's important to understand his background in that regard and also the Bill whole Bell helicopter situation. Uh, and uh, so I've been strongly affiliated with them the last couple of years in helping drive some research there. Uh, and it, it just, it blows my mind. They're not Americans, okay? They're 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 um, they're 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 British or Scottish or you know, uh, and they they care they care about the history, uh, and I think that's remarkable that they will spend that time. And there's also there's some young people in there, okay. So passing the torch on to you folks. Um, they also still, handle conspiracies better than we do. We don't talk about they don't talk about conspiracies like we talk about conspiracies over here. I've talked to Russell Kent and all those Bart Camp and all those that uh. They'll break it down for you how they view conspiracy in uh, the UK. But one thing to them, I mean, it's the same thing with us with uh, Princess Diana. We have a large interest in how Princess Diana died. And if you look into that, there is a lot of stuff that's very weird in that royal family. And over there, they're like, yeah, that's just how it happened, which is interesting because it's like, you guys know that's your royal family or whatever. And they'll openly talk about like, yeah, and that's why we're that's why they're interested in subjects like the JFK stuff, because for us, it's can be unfathomable that something like that could happen to our president or it could be more than just what the official government says. But over there, they're like, no, we're used to our government keeping a lot of secrets. You would think that with what's transpired over the last 40 years, Watergate, 
Iran-Contra. I mean, you can just go down the list, right? That that onion would have been peeled back layer by layer that maybe it's not quite so unfathomable after all, right? But it, it, it's amazing what you still get of, you still working on that? Like, get a life, right? And it's like, well, my life is what it is because of what happened 60 years ago. That we wouldn't live in the same world that we live in now. It wouldn't be a perfect world. It would be a very different parallel universe that we would be in if that hadn't happened. So I think it's, um, I obviously think that it's worth every minute and dollar I've ever given to it. Um, and uh, I think it's extremely sad that private citizens have had to uh, carry the torch on this for all these years. Um, but thank goodness that they do. Thank goodness for my generation to be able to have a chance to reach out to you guys and be able to find How's you know, pick your your Warren brains. Commission um, project coming? My what? Commission? Your Warren Commission? Uh, yeah, well, we'll talk about that off air. That'll, that'll, okay. That'll, okay. That'll, um, <laughs> you can edit that out. Yeah. Nancy, I'm going to link all your links in the description. It's been a pleasure chatting with you again. Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank Podcast, and stay tuned for our next episode.